Good morning, good morning, and welcome to a very chilly sunrise safari. My name is Jamie. I have Vian on camera with me this morning. Brent will be out with Dave in a few moments. And we're coming to you live from Juma and Arethusa Game Reserves in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. Not only are we live, but we are also interactive, so you can send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. And please do let us know. And if you're a new viewer, please don't be afraid to ask questions, but tell your friends and tell your family about the largest safari vehicle on the planet. Oh, what exciting times we have lying ahead for all of us. Tingana was on an impala kill yesterday morning and yesterday afternoon. Brent spent two hours tracking him before actually witnessing the kill on foot and racing back to get the vehicle. Now, last night when we left him, we actually closed the, or Taxon actually closed the sighting to say that it was not allowed to be viewed after dark on the basis that Tingana hadn't quite got around to pulling the impala up a tree. Tingana, of course, being a big male leopard, just in case any of you didn't, weren't aware of that. Now, that means that with spotlights about, it adds to an extra level of distraction for the animal. And, of course, it means the possibility that a hyena could come and steal his kill away from him, which is not something that... Happened. But when it gets a little bit lighter, we'll be able to go and see if he hasn't managed to put it up in a tree and he's... But those of you watching the Juma Dam camera will also be aware that there is a lioness calling somewhere to the south of me. Oh, I think that Brent's just trying to get hold of me. Hold on a moment. Standing by. Okay, copy that. Um, I've just come down to the pan now. I uh, didn't go and check around the dam side. I think I'll turn around and go that side. So John, you've picked up on the same tracks that Brent has seen moving up past away towards quarantine. He's got male leopard tracks heading up in that direction and a lioness tracks coming down towards the pan along the same road. Brent's gonna go and check further south in the direction I was going to go and I'm going to go back over the dam wall, see if we can't figure out where that male leopard has gone. Hopefully, I'm hoping it's not Tingana having lost his kill and moving off. He was very full bellied when he made that impala kill. Uh, he was not eating it with tremendous relish. So let us just see if we can't figure out exactly where those tracks have come from and where they've gone. myself working around the Juma Dam, checking out the tracks that are around there. Brent says he's got a load of lip, uh, lion tracks trotting all around the dam area, now moving up towards quarantine, so he's heading in that direction. I'm going to cut across the dam itself and check on the northern side, see if they didn't decide to move towards the Galago Pan area. Once it gets a little bit lighter, then we'll go and we'll check up on whatever's happened around Tingana's kill site. So interesting because we can hear lions calling, or we did hear lions calling this morning, much further to the south of where we are now. So they must have, it's either a different set of lions or they've cut south from quarantine. It's 
see if we can't figure out exactly which way the two sets of big cats moved across last night. Isn't that awesome? The Juma Dam playing host to two of the biggest species of cat in one night. Now, Diana, you were wondering, you know what a lion's roar sounds like, but you've heard story that a leopard soars. And the answer is that is a leopard's equivalent of a roar, so like a lion. And it basically sounds, and forgive me all leopards in South Africa, for I am about to butcher your call. Let me just get over this dip. A leopard sawing sounds something like this. <sighs> So it sounds like somebody sawing wood. That's a leopard's roar. And I think those of you out there, perhaps you should be sending in your best impression of a leopard sawing. My throat obviously wasn't up to the challenge this morning, but you never know. Give me a shout and see if you can send through your best video of what a leopard saw sounds like. And really, to me, it does sound like somebody sawing wood. Now, Brent's on those tracks. Let's find out what his plans are for the morning. Good morning and welcome to the Sunrise Safari. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I have Dangerous Dave on the camera. So there is our lion tracks going in all sorts of directions around quarantine. I did hear them calling to the southeast. So I'm gonna leave these tracks now while it's dark and try and make my way to where I heard them. Hopefully they're still on our property. So exciting times. And once it is a little bit lighter, one of Jamie or myself will go check that last position of Tingana. Hopefully he hasn't lost that impala to hyenas overnight. But a beautiful clear morning. There's not a cloud in the sky. So hopefully we're going to find lots of animals for all our wonderful safari guests on the back of the vehicle. So I did my little impression of leopards, a leopard sawing there. And Catherine said, oh, leopard saw. I didn't know that. I learned so much here. Well, we're happy to teach and happy to share our love for Africa with you guys. So I'm just looking for tracks, making sure we don't miss a line. And you can see a beautiful sky in the east. Kevin Catfish, I said at between 4 and 4.30, a herd of buffalo were being disturbed by something mysterious at the pan. Well, not that mysterious, Kevin. It was lions. Uh, I saw their tracks where they were chasing the buffalo, but we found the buffalo all intact. So uh, they obviously managed to see off that threat. Quite chilly this morning. And we are heading towards these beautiful dry season skies uh, of not a cloud in sight. Now, Anna Marie has, hopes that Tingana has hoisted that Impala kill. Uh, me too, Anna Marie. Uh, I've got, I, w I don't want to be negative, but I do have the sneaky suspicion that he has not. And I think, I think he might have lost it overnight. You never know. Uh, that's why we'll check, but we'll wait till it's a little bit more light before heading in there. And we can see what actually happened if he has lost it.
being checked for tracks on the western side. Jamie is checking. Back. While Brent checks along the western edge of quarantine, we're going to check the northern section of the dam, see if those lions or leopard didn't come across in this direction. So far, no sign of them. Now, last night, we received a report right at the end of the sunset safari that an Nkuhuma lioness had crossed onto Juma. So she's obviously come from the east. The question is now, has she met up with the rest of the pride or is it just her walking around, calling for them? Not entirely sure which it's going to turn out to be. We'll just have to wait until the mystery unravels itself. I'm checking all of these drainage line areas, a favorite of both the lionesses as well as the leopards. I don't think I see any tracks in here. Uh, Arlene, who has been joining us for the first time over the last few drives, Aline is saying that she's never heard the term sawing before when applied to a leopard and was wondering if perhaps it was a, or wond wondering whether or not a leopard chuffs in the same way tigers do. No, they don't really chuff like tigers. The sawing is their roaring sound, as, as we said. And then their contact calls, they do sort of, they can make bow, bow sounds to their cubs, but they don't chuff in the same way that tigers do. So they've got an interesting wide vocal range, as do lions as well. The one, the animal out here was probably the strangest in terms of the big cats, in, with the strangest vocal noises that they make is a cheetah. Cheetah can chirp almost like birds. Chirp, chirp, chirp. It's the cutest sound. The cheetah chirp, they cannot roar. That's why one of the reasons why they are not lumped together in the same grouping as leopards or lions. That and, of course, the completely different physical design, as well as the constantly extended claws, so non-retractable claws, as opposed to the extendable and retractable claws of leopards and lions. Oh, we could see cheetah out here. We have before. Fingers crossed when Cheetah Plains comes to be and we're driving around there, we'll see them even more frequently. Now that's a lovely idea. James, I do indeed have VM's calipers with me. They are sitting in the vehicle, whoopsie, along with the beautifully painted Easter eggs from yesterday's Easter egg hunt that I still haven't quite got rid of just yet. Um, but yes, I have the calipers. I think it's a lovely idea to compare Mvula and Tingana's tracks. I just want to make sure that the tracks that Brent found are actually Tingana's. And the best way, or at least to within the closest approximation that we can get, so what I want to do is just make sure that those tracks have come across from where Tingana had that kill to here. But either way, let's go and compare them. When we do find those tracks, we'll go and compare the size of them and just see if we can't figure out if, or just see, judging by the size difference, that it is him. I mean, it could be Mvula. Mvula was last seen on Simbabili yesterday afternoon. So he's still running scared in a completely different area to where he usually is. That doesn't discount him though. Leopards can cover enormous distances during the night or during the day if they choose to. With their really rapid strides. Sorry, I just want to check here. No, it's just hyena walking along. Hyena and civet. So whilst I suspect that it is Tingana's tracks, I don't know for certain, it could be unlikely, but it could be that large mystery male, the skittish male that we've seen a couple of times. Again, I don't think so. 
it's a little bit far out of his territory, especially with Tingana having been hanging out in this area. Shame, I hope Tingana didn't lose his kill last night. It does happen. If he didn't hoist it in a tree, um, or he might even, he might have lost it to hyenas, he might even just have abandoned it. It does occasionally occur that a cat that's been eating regularly and well might decide to abandon a carcass for a number of different reasons. One might be that he's heard another leopard in his territory and he wants to go and investigate. Another might be an approach by a female. There could be a couple of different reasons. Uh, Karula, for example, had a half-eaten Dacre kill up a jackalberry tree a couple of weeks ago before she had her cubs. And Tundi and Tingana were mating right in the middle of her territory, which I think she found so unimpressive and so off-putting that she abandoned the day, immediately lost her appetite and went to go and growl quietly at her daughter. And as you can imagine, she must have been heavily pregnant at that point, so it must have been even more goading to have Tundi around. It was right before she had her cubs. Strangia, you were wondering, did Tingana manage to at least eat some of his carcass yesterday since you missed the sunset safari? Yes, he did. He did eat it. He did eat a little bit of it, not scoffing into it like a, uh, bless you, Bill. Um, not sort of tucking into it in the same way a hungry leopard might do, but he did feed on it. We'll go and investigate. Now that it's light enough, we'll go and investigate. In the meantime, Brent has found the lions. Well, guess what we found? A bunch of smelly looking lions. So these are the guys who are calling. So I think they've walked straight through the center of Juma. We've now found them right on our eastern boundary. Look at them. They look like they've been eating something, or at least rolling in something. So we've got four out of the five boys. And there's one lying on the other side of the road, and there's three on our side of the road. And I'm hoping they still give one or two more roars in the early morning. No, so we don't really need the spotlight there. Hello, big boys. So I think this is what was harassing buffalo around the pan last night. Unfortunately, they weren't successful. Wouldn't it be nice if they caught a buffalo on our doorstep? Oh. He's had a busy night. Head's getting heavy. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Located for Birmingham and Gola. Twin Dams Junction, Gary, Main. Copy, thanks. Thanks. Small four, my daughter, there. FM4, my daughter, here. Yeah. Oh, look at that, Dave. Can you spot the jet plane? Now, right on the horizon, cutting through the cold air. And that is more than likely coming from uh, I'm going to guess this is the London flight, and it lands at about 6 a.m. in Johannesburg and flies directly over this part of the world. So a big safari live welcome to Barbara, who's a brand new viewer. And she's wondering how I know she's been posting and she doesn't see any Bluetooth device for me to see what she's saying. Well, we have directors who sit in our final control and they send us through the questions and they watch the different forms of social media and email.
So, guys, I just need to give a quick update on the Eastern Channel because we're on the boundary. Oh, not bull ducks flying, Dave, in the silhouette. So, here we go. We're going to get them. There they go. Off the go, the knobball ducks in search of some pans. Uh, morning stations in the east. Is anyone copying me? Hello. Uh, at four, Birmingham, my daughter's Gary Main uh, Junction with Twin Dams or Baboon Pan. Uh, one station here and one another station from the north making their way. Space for one. Copy, thanks. Uh, if you can't get hold of me, I'm going to be jumping between the two channels to make sure we don't get too many more vis uh, like last time the Ngalo here. Uh, morning, Fijian Southern Drive. We'll be up, up late. That'll be all take step by one. Uh, so, guys, unfortunately, I have to put my radio on scan because we're right on the boundary between the east and the north, so to speak. So, to make sure we can manage it properly, uh, I've got to jump between channels, and a lot of the guys in the east don't have the northern channel. So I do apologize for the radio chatter that's going to be happening. So just as I was waking up this morning, and Jamie and I were walking towards the car. We heard these guys calling in the distance. So Sandra says, look how beat up these boys are looking. I don't think too beat up. I think they caught something small and uh, they've had a big fight over the meat that's there. And you can actually see if we zoom in on these two particularly, you can see there looks like there's blood and stomach contents on them. They are looking a little bit manky this morning, not looking very pretty. But they've obviously had a snack overnight. And also walking through the dew gives them a slightly bedraggled look as well. Stations in the north. I've kept one space open for anyone who'd like to come to these Birmingham Madodas. Okay, copy, thanks very much. Sorry, guys. As soon as someone else gets here, I'll hand over the control of the radio, but till then, uh, it's just me here, so I do have to make sure that everyone gets the best and most fair chance to see these boys. Now, fingers crossed that they decide to give us one more bout of roaring before it gets too warm. So the fifth Birmingham has been on honeymoon and he's been mating with an Nkuma lioness, and I think that's probably the one that is not here at the moment. But from what I heard, they finished mating yesterday, and that one Nkuma lioness did head back into Juma. So we will try to have a look for them a little later, but I think for now, let's stick with these fat, lazy, big boys. We can see those paws. So those are what we were following down the road, the tracks left by them. And on nice dewy mornings, they, they do, do shine very nicely. Uh, 
do dyan ka ano. Sari may do dyan. Sari soyo. One more for food there now. I want you to know what I want from there. Okay, so I'm going to have to have a bout of serious game drive chatter, so I'm sure you guys don't want to listen to that. So we're going to jump across to, to Jamie while I just deal with the radio quickly. Okay, so we've got news on Tingana while Sprint is just sorting out game drive comms, and that is the fact that he's lost his kill. We're not sure how, I'm just listening to Taxon on the radio, but it seems as though he has lost that kill. This wildebeest was calling on quarantine. I don't think it was an alarm call though. I think it was more a territorial call. Just have a look at him since he's presenting such a beautiful view to us. See how black the face is all the way to the top of the horns? That plus the fact that they extend past the ears, if he looks at us at some point. It's not always immediately apparent if you're looking at a female or a male wildebeest. In this case, it's a lone male, making his way quite possibly to go and have a drink around the Juma Dam pan. Oh, <laughs> I love it when they do that. He's having a great time. That's a combination of dust feeling good around his parasites and itches, and the fact that he has a pre-orbital scent gland just around his eyes. So very common for wildebeest to rub their heads against trees, particularly where they have a sort of a regular midden site, as I'm sure most of you know. Wildebeest, male wildebeest have a different approach. Rather than trying to collect females, they like to defend a territory. And the better the territory, the more appropriate it is, and therefore the more females they're going to attract. So obviously, territory like this, lots of grass, lots of water, is a really good place to be. Albeit you have to share with a couple of buffalo. Let's just see if any of them decide to chase him grumpily. Oh, he's not taking any chances. He's going to dash right past them. <laughs> is it? It is a really, truly beautiful morning. So yes, he definitely was in the process of um, defending his territory. So that, that rubbing against the sand was a combination of scent mark, marking as well as just enjoying a morning dust bath. The reason he sprinted past the buffalo is because buffalo are notoriously grumpy and they have been known to chase other animals, including wildebeest. There was that amazing situation with Brent and the brand new wildebeest calf that was only a couple of minutes old, that promptly got, walked past a buffalo, made its first big mistake in life, luckily not the worst mistake it could have made, walked past a buffalo and the buffalo immediately knocked it over with its horns. And baby wildebeest demonstrating that incredible ability of young mammals to spring back up again. But nevertheless, an important lesson in that young wildebeest life, and who knows, maybe our wildebeest that ran past the buffalo has also learned that particular lesson at some point in his life. It's the same group of buffalo that I saw yesterday. I'm sure I saw a zebra as well. But I'm faced with a very empty clearing, which suggests maybe not. I'm going to go on and search and see if I can't figure out where Tingana went from his kill site while I do that. Let's go back across to Brent and his lions. So we've got one raised head. Oh, very slightly raised before back down. And there's not much that can really sleep like a male lion. I mean, there's not much to challenge a male lion out here apart from possibly another male lion. And the only thing that'll really chase them when they're in this type of spot and having a nap would be elephants. So it looks like they traversed around a lot of Juma last night chasing buffalo. And unfortunately, as I said, I think they did catch something small just judging by the mess around a lot of their faces. 
but nothing big. So whatever it was, it's all gone. Now, big male lions like this have a huge appetite, and they're able to engulf up to about 15 kilograms of meat in a single sitting. So, Red, who's a brand new viewer on YouTube, welcome to Safari Live. And um, he's saying, do, when lions lie around like this, does it mean they have just eaten? Not necessarily. Lions are not the most energetic of creatures, and they're designed to be so. They, only, they sleep for about 20 hours out of 24, so they can be quite lazy. Lazy is the wrong word. They have a great difficulty in dealing with heat, and that is why they're mostly nocturnal, and they'll do a lot of their moving at, at night, and that moving will also be in little bouts. They'll normally move and walk for 20 minutes, half an hour, lie down for 20 minutes, half an hour, and during the daylight hours, you'll probably find them sleeping for the majority of the daylight hours. Sometimes now in the early morning, you might find them moving. But as it gets warmer, I'll find a nice shady spot and spend the day sleeping. So Jamie's going to have a look where Tingana had that impala kill last night. And it wasn't the hyena who stole his impala. Apparently, the tracks of these lions went straight into where his kill was and disappeared with what was left of his impala. So that's probably what they snacked on last night. So, a big Safari Live welcome to Maddie, who's a brand new viewer on YouTube. Uh, Maddie would like to know why the lions don't seem to care about us being here. Well, Maddie, very, very simple explanation, because we're in a car. If we were on foot, it would be a very different story. Uh, they would probably run away from us on foot. Humans are the... Oh, bless you. The dominant diurnal animal is the human being, so they are, have a certain amount of respect for us in daylight hours. Oh, shh, 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 shh. they're gonna roar. Stay on him, he looks like he's about to roar. Gave a slight little, mm. like he might think about it. But no, <laughs> back to some, no, back to snoozing. Let me just finish off with Maddie's question. Sorry, we got sidetracked there a little bit. So Maddie's wondering why they don't worry about us in a, in a car. Now, a car's only been around for about 100 years, uh, just over 100 years, and they don't have an instinctive response to a car like they would to a hu the upright bipedal figure of a human being. So a car also doesn't smell like anything particularly appetizing. It smells like diesel or petrol and oil and it's just this big thing it doesn't smell like food it doesn't act like food and if you drive carefully they become very very used to the vehicles like these are and they pretty much ignore them so it is great to be able to spend time with these animals 
And in an area like the Sabi Sands, we've, these lines have probably, and they come from the Timbavati, which is another game reserve, these lines have spent their whole lives since young cubs being viewed on game drive vehicles. So it is just normal for them. has noticed that the lions almost have a little bit of makeup under their eyes, that really white sort of stance there. Now, you'll notice that on leopards as well. And a lot of nocturnal animals will have that there, and it's to help catch as much ambient light in the darkness as possible. As we've mentioned many, many times, uh, cheetah will have the opposite. They've got dark under their eyes because they are mainly diurnal hunters. Natasha, who's in Ontario, is wondering, can lions swim? They can. They don't particularly like it sometimes, but in certain parts of Africa, they're forced to cross lots of different rivers and lakes, like in northern Botswana, in the Okavango Delta. They are forced to swim quite regularly. So there, those lions swim. Here, you'll find that the lions swim very infrequently. And we do... I have seen them swim in the Sabi Sands before, crossing the Sand River, and it's quite a sight because they seem to hiss at the water, and the, the, the lions here have a very big, healthy respect for crocodiles. So, Sophia, who's a brand new viewer on YouTube, says, hi guys, I'm new here. What's going on? What is this thing that's happening? Well, Sophia, welcome to a live African safari. We're sitting in the heart of, of the Lofalt in the Greater Kruger National Park, and we're sitting next to four male lions having a snooze live. So you're seeing these at the same time as me. Sorry, guys, I just need to get onto the radio again quickly. So just excuse me. Able, able. I'm for a new farmer who will call tax in. Is Orbs out yet? I'm very now. Okay, copy, thanks. So guys, well, Jamie's got some female lion tracks. Let's go have a look while I deal with the logistics of running a sighting. I did have, I promise you, I did have lioness tracks about two seconds ago, and I think they've just gone off the road. Hold on one second. I just want to check further up ahead, make sure that they don't come back on. Otherwise, we'll go back and I'll show you the tracks that I was talking about. Been tracking them all the way up into the road, just to the point that Brent sent you back over to me. Mm. No, she's gone off the road. Okay, so let's go back and I'll show you the tracks that I was talking about and then I will continue to track her. It must be that lioness that they saw crossing onto the property yesterday. 
trying to relocate the rest of the Nkuhuma pride. I'm just making sure that she's not in the road somewhere ahead of me. These tracks are very, very fresh. Sorry, Bim. Didn't mean to bash you on the head of the branch. Watch out. There you go. Tracks on top of all of the vehicle tracks, every other track on the road, and crisp and clear in this morning light. So whenever she, I think she walked along this road relatively recently in the last few hours or so, there's a good chance, you know the way that lions walk, they cover a little bit of distance and then they stop and they lie down for a rest. Hopefully we catch her before she decides to cross either across our western or across our east, uh, northern boundary. Right, she must have gone off. Hmm? Ah, Liam thinks he spotted where she lay down. Are you able to get that on camera? Perfect, beautiful. There you go, her track right in the middle. Thank you, Vian, well spotted. And there, this ground all scuffed. And in fact, it looks, I'm trying to work out if it looks like more than one individual. We thought we saw two sets of tracks initially, but then when I started following them down the road, they'd moved. Okay, so she's cut into onto that game path from where they were lying down straight to the north there you see that path that runs up into the block animals as you know like to use paths it's slightly easier it's the same reason that they like to use roads it is an easier passage it's quieter and it means less of moving through an area well spotted vm Awesome. This is why we have such great cameramen. They can help us track as well as film everything that we're doing. Let's go see if we can't find her. Last we heard, the Nkuhuma pride was on Manuleti, apart from the female that was wandering across Juma. Let's go onto Aubrey's Road and see if we can't track her. Unless she's hiding in there somewhere. Now we've got to know our lions of this area very, very well. And TV Stain was actually wondering how many lions do we have? There she is, got her. I had a feeling those tracks were so fresh. Can you see her there, Viam? She's, you got her. Hey! Lion day today! Exciting stuff. Let's go and make our way a little bit closer. Vim, that was some good teamwork there. Hee <laughs> hee. That's terribly exciting. Unfortunately, it's a very thick block, so we're gonna have to make our way in, or find our way in here. While we work our way a little bit closer to her, let's go back over to Brent and his lions. Well, what a lion morning. Jamie's just found the girls. I'm not sure exactly where. So we've got the boys and the girls out and about on Juma this morning. So exciting stuff. And Jamie's just going to offer a little bit to try to get closer to that lioness. And then we'll be able to have a look who it is. I'm pretty sure it might be one of the Nkahuma ladies who was mating with these boys. So what's going to happen, these guys, I think they're pretty much done moving for the for the, for the evening or for the morning. The only movement they're going to do from here is when it gets a bit warm, they're going to find some shade. Hopefully, they find some shade back towards our side and don't venture further to the south. But unfortunately, it seems that their patrol normally goes further to the south uh, than to the north. They've already come through from around quarantine where they were chasing buffalo.
So it must have been quite a spectacular scene if these four male lions stole Mr. Tingana's dinner. So he would have made quick, quick time getting away from there. And the fight that would have ensued with four male lions fighting over such a small carcass as an impala would have been quite incredible. And that's why we've got this very dirty face. They've got some stomach contents on them. They've got a bit of blood. So it is would have been really, really interesting. But a male leopard would have got out of there very quickly. I don't think he would have even looked over his shoulder at four male lions advancing. If we look on this guy here, you can see some of that sort of stomach content and whatnot I was talking about, and on his face. So that would have been from feeding and fighting. These boys are very, very sleepy. Sorry, guys, I do need to get onto the Game Drive channel again to, to organize the logistics. So these guys aren't moving. So we're going to see if we can go back to Jamie while I sort out um, the pandemonium that's ensuing on the Game Drive channel. There we go. We have attempted to squeeze our way in here. It is very, very thick. There are, in fact, two lionesses here. That looks like amber eyes. Is that? No, it's not. I thought it was amber eyes. It isn't. But I'm fairly certain it's one of the Guhuma lionesses. The second is lying up to the left, unfortunately, very much behind a bush. As you can see, the vegetation is very thick here, so we can't get too much closer at the moment. But I don't, I don't think that they're actually going to stay here. I think that they're going to carry on moving, probably try and look for the rest of their pride. Hello, girl. Yes, I see you looking. Here are the rest of your ladies. What a wonderful start to the morning. And the nice thing is nobody wants to come to our lionesses, so we've got them all to ourselves. Yep, she's getting up. <laughs> now, Phil has suggested that one of our lionesses... Oh, no, she's not getting up. She's lying down again. Um, Phil has suggested one of our lionesses might be having a secret meeting with Birmingham boy number five, quite possibly continuing to broker the peace deal that has been established between these lionesses and the males that Brent has. They have been seen mating over the last few months, different individuals at different times. The last one we saw was, when was that? It was about 10 days ago, around Twin Dams, before she rejoined the rest of her pride and he moved off to rejoin his brothers and cousins. Now, the Inkahumas seem to split and come back together on a very regular basis, not always necessarily connected to the movements of the Birmingham boys. And it does sometimes beg the question that some of them are not disappearing off to mate with the Birmingham boys, particularly when all Birmingham boys are present and accounted for, but also the possibility that they are sneaking in mating sessions with other males of the surrounding areas. Why do I say that? Well, that's what Re recent research has shown is that lionesses, just like female leopards, 
will attempt to mate with as many males as possible in order to ensure the survival of their cubs. So that basically every single male within a nearby vicinity or that they might possibly encounter could be tricked into thinking that they are the father of the cubs. I'm trying to work out exactly which lionesses they are, but for those of you who get the closer view from the camera, if you could let me know and just confirm that it is the Nkuhuma lionesses, that would be hugely helpful. We were very lucky to spot the tawny lionesses lying down right behind a termite mound. They are so beautifully camouflaged, particularly when she has her head down like that. Thank goodness she looked up at us as we drove past. Although I think I probably would have walked from that position otherwise. But say what was wondering, do lionesses get different colored coats at different times of the year? Or do lions? The answer is no, they don't. Their coat color will change more with age and will be, will be varied depending on the area that you're watching lions in. When they are born, when they are young cubs, they are quite spotty. They're covered in little spots all over them, particularly the belly and the legs, as an extra degree of camouflage for them when, when they're at their sort of most vulnerable. As they start to grow older, those spots almost, but never quite, disappear. But once they've reached their adult coloring, that is what they will stay at for the rest of their lives. They might go, some lionesses go a little bit paler as they get older. And male lions very often go darker. Their manes grow darker with age. So the Birmingham boys from, from November when I saw one for the last time in the space of about two and a half months, have, their manes have filled out tremendously and they have gone darker with time. I know that I'm sure many of you wish to get, or want to get another view of the lioness that's at the back. I promise you that I will try and get there. It's just going to be a rather interesting experience. Here you go. You can see her in the process of licking her foot. You can just see the flashes of movement in the sun behind her. And in fact, I'd like to get onto the other side of them at some point to try and view them from in this beautiful morning light, because it is a stunning morning. In this thick green vegetation. Oh. TB Stain, you're just comparing our sighting between Brent's Birmingham boys and our lionesses. And you were wondering, are lionesses in general cleaner than the males? It depends what they've been doing. I, Yes, to an extent. Actually, now that you mention it, I have noticed that lionesses tend to be a little bit cleaner. That being said, if they're busy feeding off a carcass, they aren't terribly concerned by being covered in bits of carcass and stomach contents and whatever else they happen to be. Now, it's very hard for me while they're lying down at this distance to tell you exactly how full they are or when last they ate, but they are looking relatively clean compared to... And when I last saw the Birmingham boys, they were also looking... I think a grubby is probably the best description I could give them, but it depends on what the lion's doing. And I don't think there's any great difference between the hygiene of a male versus a female. I mean, at the moment, the female at the back, though you can't see her, is clearly having a jolly good clean. Now, licking of the paws like that, if they start to yawn, and if both lionesses start licking their feet, then there is a good chance that they're going to get up. Personally, I don't think they're going to stay here. I think that they are... I think they are planning on carrying on. They just happen to lie down for a quick break. I'm just listening to the Game Drive channel quickly. listening to Ephraim chatting a bit about maybe looking for Tingana and whether or not he's found any drag marks leading away from the carcass. 
From what we can tell, as I said earlier, it seems as though, or as Brent, I'm sure, has mentioned, it seems as though the lion stole Tingana's kill last night. So this time, not the hyena responsible for the theft, but either the lionesses that we're looking at now or the male lions that Brent is seeing. There's tracks leading away from that sighting. Now, while I try... Now, while I try and reposition, let's go back across to Brent and find out what he thinks or who he thinks stole Tingana's kill. So these big boys have not moved an inch since you were last here. The beautiful morning light has descended upon them, though. Making them look a little bit more pretty in their scruffiness this morning. So Eileen has noticed that their noses still look a little bit pink, so she thinks they must be quite young, even though they are the dominant males. Well, Eileen, they're, they're around six now, and pink noses and lions is, a, is, is not a very accurate way to, to age a lion. I've seen lions that I've known are well over 10 years old with pink noses. So it's a very general rule and not a very very good rule. Uh, you do find animals with, that have pink noses throughout their lives, but uh, normally in a lot of lions, their noses do go black the older they get, or, or darker. But in this case, you can see he's six and he's still got a pink nose. Where are my binoculars now? I thought I spotted something. Oh, Devin, you see this guy who's got his back to us? Mm. It looks like he's got a little bit of a wound behind his ear there. Where have I put my binoculars? So, there we go. That looks quite fresh as well. Just have a quick look. Um, mm, looks like it is quite fresh, and you probably find that's from fighting with his coalition mates over that small impala last night that they stole from Mr. Tingana. That doesn't look too serious, just a superficial... Superficial wound. Now, it does look like they are just fast, fast asleep. So Bill and Marsha are wondering about social dynamics in male lions. Is the oldest the most dominant? Um, is he here? Is he off mating? Well, it's generally the most aggressive is the most dominant, and that can change. So there's a constant sort of shifting in male coalitions uh, with dominance varying between the different individuals depending on the exact moment or time. So at the moment, while they're all lying like this and there's no female to fight over or no food to fight over, it's very difficult to distinguish which one is, is dominant. And a lot of those dominance plays, etc., only become important when there's a female or food to fight over. So Karen, who's in Pickering, would like to know about male lion's manes. 
and how long do they take to grow, when do they start showing, etc., etc. So you can see the main start developing even from quite young, from below a year, but just a little sort of tuft underneath the uh, the chin, so to speak, and a little tuft behind the ears. And it is a, a sign of testosterone, so it's testosterone that causes uh, the mane, and the darker the mane, the, the higher the testosterone level in the lion. And in research in Tanzania, the darker the male mane's lion, um, the more pr preferential mating he gets. The females actually seek out darker male lions, and they seem to have a longer mating life than the blondies. Now, they can continue to grow throughout uh, a lion's life, but you could probably say from anything from about now six, six years, five, six years, that they are fully developed. Guys, I don't think they're going to move too much. So we have had a spectacular sighting, and there are lots of people waiting to come see these lions. And I think we're probably going to move off shortly. And see what else we can find in this glorious morning light. And so we're going to leave these big boys. We will be, we might come check on them a little bit later, but as I said, this is about the most action they're gonna show for now. So let's go see what the Inkahuma girls are up to with Jamie. Now, I haven't had a chance to reposition just yet. We were just making sure that our camera lens was clean and free of any dust and rubbish. But the lionesses are still here. Oh. The one lioness is showing signs of skittishness. She's been, not this lioness that's lying down, obviously, she's quite happily fast asleep. But the other that's still at the back there keeps lifting her head and keeping a very close eye. Not so, not so much on me, but I think the sounds of an elephant herd moving across behind us. I can't tell you exactly where those sounds are coming from. It sounds as though they're across the road on the other side of the block. Also just been trying to listen to the Game Drive channel. Ephraim, it seems, had a brief visual of a male leopard close to Buffles Hook Dam. But it seems as though it's that very skittish male that's been hanging out there because he said that he saw it and immediately the leopard moved away from him. So uh, they could well be there. I do want to try and reposition. Um, there's a lot of trees and bushes, so it is going to make a little bit of a noise. So let's just stick with these lionesses for now, with the view that we have. One very sleepy-looking lioness. I also want to try and double-check that it is just the two of them, and not the rest of them hiding further in the block. Sandra is one of our newer viewers and would like to know a little bit about the dynamics of the lion prides in this area and how many and which ones. You said that she's a little bit too new to know them all just yet. Sandra, my suspicion is that this is an Inkuhuma lioness, Inkuhuma being the local name for a tree known as a brown ivory tree. Now this pride initially, when I first started working here, was a pride of eight strong with six lionesses, two sub-adult lionesses, and one sub-adult male. Apparently it was nine just a few months previously to that, or prior to that, when there was another adult lioness. Now, 
two of the lionesses killed by the Birmingham boys, one of the sub-adult lionesses also killed in the process of that whole takeover. We're left with five lionesses, four fully grown lionesses and the one surviving sub-adult lioness that has now reached adulthood. The last member of the pride that has now moved off was a male called Junior, who was part of his pride. He was just at that age where he was going to start dispersing anyway. He was around three years old when the Birmingham boy takeover occurred. And as a result, because the, the lionesses were attempting to protect him and because it is such a dangerous thing for a lion pride to have a young male with them, because all of the males in the area will target him as potential competition, there was a time when the lionesses, the Nkuhma lionesses, were basically gone from our lives for a while. They were running scared. But eventually, Junior moved off. The lionesses started mating with... Let the Franklin finish their conversation. Ooh. There's an angry elephant somewhere, trumpeting in the distance. Could be what's made the lionesses a bit skittish. But yes, yeah, sorry, back to the pride. Junior moved off. The Inkahumas started mating with the Birmingham boys as a sort of a... Plas um, in order to placate them and to pla placify them. The takeover has now been successful, and we're probably anticipating in the next two or so months potential new arrivals to the Nkuhuma Pride to boost their numbers. So as it stands, five lionesses, one just about um, reaching adulthood. Now, there's also the Styx Pride, the Styx Pride that we see in this region. The Styx Pride has three lionesses that we've seen recently. All three are heavily pregnant as a result of the takeover. Now, we could be also expecting new arrivals from them. There's the five Birmingham boys, four of which you saw this morning with Brent. There's a fifth one off somewhere doing something, possibly with a lioness, possibly just moving off on his own. Male coalitions do split and come together like that very regularly. There's also the Salala Pride, or the, yes, the Salala Pride. Three sub-adult young males, one tailless lioness and one lioness or two other lionesses, depending. They've also been in a bit of a state of flux because the Birmingham boy takeover, when they moved into this area, they actually kicked out two males known as the Matimba males. The Matimba males crossed south to Londolozi, and by the way, they are both fine and well. After that fight with the Majingalans, there was a moment that they were considered, one of them were, was considered possibly badly injured, if not dead, but he seems to be fine. But they went into the Londolozi area, so to the south of us, and essentially did what the Birmingham boys did to the Nkuhumas, which was terrorize the Salala pride a little bit, particularly the Salalas with the three young sub-adult males. So they pushed up into this area for a while. And that's, those are generally our key players within the lion grouping around here. There's, odd, there's additional players. There's the Salati males to the north in Buffelshook. We hardly ever see them. We've seen them about twice. One of whom has got quite a bad limp and has had a bad limp for months now, but is still doing fine. It's also the, the Talamati pride with a couple of youngsters, or quite a few cubs of around, I think there's around eight of the cubs, seven or eight of them. We've never seen them. I've never seen them. I don't think they've ever been seen on the live shows, but we could potentially, depending on how lion territories fluctuate over the next few months. I don't think so, though. And that some, largely sums up our main lion players in this area. Diana, I don't know. I don't know that these are the Nkuhuma lionesses. It's very hard for me to judge at the moment with this view, with one with her head, well, both with their heads down. I suspect it's them. I can't tell you for absolute certain. I'm guessing it's them because of the current position that we're in. The Styx females, whilst they do come up towards the Juma Pan, have recently remained far further to the south. So right in the sort of central core area of their home range. They overlap with the Inkahumas, basically around Juma and Arethusa, and Cheetah Plains as well, and Coral Sides, so to the southeast of where we are now. And they have come into conflict before. Now, just seeing two here, and I can only see two, and I don't think there are any others hiding away, I can't tell you for absolute certain that it is the Nkuhumas. I think it is. When it comes to identifying individual lions, a lot of them have nice nicks and scars. You, you factor in different combinations. One is the area that they're in, which makes it more likely that it's the Nkuhuma lionesses. 
two is their whisker spot patterns. So the dark spots along where they, the rows of their whiskers remain the same throughout their lives. So you can actually, if you're looking for the proper scientific method, that would be how you go about it. And then a lot of our, I mean, our viewers have come to know, and we've come to know the Nkumas very, very well. And you get an idea of just the overall size and impression of the animal, what they look like generally, just like you, you learn to recognize people to an extent. That's not to say we don't always get it wrong, particularly since we don't share the exact same view that you see through your, through the camera. So I suspect it's the Nkuhumas. Um, the only thing that's made me doubtful is the size of one of those tracks, or both of those tracks, which are quite small. The Nkuhumas have incredibly large feet, but I don't know if it's just because of the dew in the sand and the way that the tracks have fallen. Maybe they just look smaller to me than normal. I'm not entirely sure. I was about to draw your attention to that Oriole, but it flew off as I thought about it. Another one chirping away, whistling away, but I can't see exactly where it is. Somebody's feeling particularly sleepy this morning. I'm sure you're all as interested as I am to work out which lionesses we have here. But we'll leave with, we'll stay with our view that we have for now. Particularly since I think it's going to take a couple of Austin Power style 20 point turns to loop around them. I'm gonna take some serious navigating skill. Uh, I do want to reposition and it's just going to take me a few moments. I'd prefer to do that whilst not on air. So let's head over to Brent for now and I will catch up with you very shortly. So we've left those lions and they're not moving at all and there's quite a lot of other vehicles that want to go have a look and we were lucky enough to have them all to ourselves for quite a while early in the morning. So I've just got a report of a male leopard, an unrelaxed male leopard that was a brief, brief glimpse was seen. So I'm slowly making my way into that area to see if we can possibly find him. It seems like the cats are out to play in this glorious morning light on this sunrise safari. Ephraim, Ephraim. If, if I want to look for that one on Ingwe, where's the best place to check? Where was the last visual you had? Yeah, keep coming to the cat and see them right here. We're going to go. I will show you the way that you will come back. Okay, Kobe, thanks very much. So, Ephraim just saw him, and there's apparently a drag marker on, so he might have a kill. So, we, what we want to do is try to establish where the kill is. If it's an unrelaxed leopard, we actually will leave him alone. We'll try to get a view of him, but we won't put too much pressure, go too close. So we obviously want them to become a relaxed leopard, and the best way to do that is at night. Leopards are far more comfortable at night, so if he has got a kill and it's up in a tree, uh, we'll start viewing at night from a bit of a bigger distance. And one must remember, Tingana was an unrelaxed male at one stage. He used to run away from cars, and now, look at him, he lies right next to us. Another new viewer, so big welcome to Steve on Saf welcome to the Safari Live family. Uh, Steve says, I'm new here, 
So I'm not sure, is Tingana a type of leopard or is it his name? Tingana is his name. It means the shy one. So when he first started being seen, he came from a western area where there's not a lot of vehicles and he was very skittish around the cars, like this leopard we're about to go look for right now. So uh, we will try with this new leopard to try slowly habituate him to being calm around a car. So it's quite an interesting time and, and one of my favorite things is to habituate uh, unrelaxed animals to the vehicles and you need quite a bit of patience and you drive quite carefully and slowly. You keep a lot more distance than you would normally, but it is quite exciting and it's always exhilarating to see a new big cat. So there's been two unrelaxed male leopards seen in, in the last while. Uh, one is a very big male, uh, you, they call Gajima, and the other is a young male. So I'm not sure which this is. I'm about to meet up with Efren. We're going to have a little meeting and discuss where the best way to look for this leopard is. While we do that, let's go have a look at those gorgeous lionesses with Jamie. have managed to reposition and as we did the second lioness just got up she's eating grass and trees uh, it's maybe with a bit of an unsettled stomach she's also got a fresh injury on her left side that looks very much like a bite wound I mentioned that she's constantly looking up she is a little bit nervous in her own way Hello, girl. Who have we got here? This is the Inkuhumas. I'm almost certain that this is the lioness, the older lioness. I'm not sure who the individual at the back is. If you guys could just confirm that for me, I'm relatively certain. Fairly empty bellies. Oh, they are relatively hungry. I wonder if they were not responsible for the loss of Tingana's kill and where the rest of the pride actually is. Beautiful in this morning light. I don't think they're going to stay here either. I still feel as though they're going to keep moving while it's cool enough for them to be able to do so. Marsha was wondering, we had to track these lioness to find them, but very often we manage to find lioness by following alarm calls or lions or any other big predator. Marsha was wondering, would, any, would there be any animals to alert us to their presence at night? And Marsha, less so than during the day. But that being said, especially on full moon nights, the monkeys will wake up and alarm call at them. The Things like dukops and thick knees, or as they're now known, thick knees, will alarm call. I just heard a zebra, so did she. That yip yip sound of zebra coming into conflict with each other. So, Marsha, thick knees might alarm call. Franklin might alarm call if they are disturbed, but for the most part, they tend to be quite happily fast asleep at night. Here the zebra go again. Just want to sit and listen for a moment, so does she. Investigating, or is that grass just a little bit too interesting? This 
song that I heard before it stopped was zebra yipping at each other. And it sounded, it didn't sound like alarm calls. It sounded like they were coming into, whether it might have been a male or a female that was being bitten by another member of the herd. It sounded like an internal dispute. She heard it as well. But difficult to hear anything over the current cacophony that the birds of Juma are making this morning. They are singing away their dawn chorus. Most prominent is the call of the Cape turtle dove. There's also the black-headed oriole whistling away. A whole wide range of robins, cisticulars, Drongo's calling as well. The birds are loving this morning, as am I. Doesn't get better than starting off your day with lionesses illuminated in the morning light. not just us that get annoyed by the biting flies out here. Let's see if we can't see the injury on this lioness as she walks towards us. It's not huge. She's walking stiffly. So something has happened. stay with them. It is going to be very tricky from our perspective. I'm going to try and stay on this game path that I can see. Hopefully we should be able to keep up with them. I didn't think they were going to stick around. I just let Taxon go ahead of me. His guests haven't had a very good view yet this morning. So I'm going to let them go ahead. I don't think that they're going to be able to, in their long vehicles, keep up as well as we will. But it would be very convenient if you just went ahead of me and cleared the way. They're going. Stopped there. And just as an interesting aside, my brakes have just gone just as a random little fact of information. Off they go. Well, this will just make the whole experience far more interesting. I wonder when that happened. I can't see any brake fluid pouring out, but there's definitely no, no resistance when I put my foot down on the brake pedal. That's OK. When I first started working as a safari guide, the vehicle I drove was completely without brakes. That's how I learned to drive off-road and whilst taking people on a game drive. So it's just like old times. Whoopsie. We'll just reevaluate, see if I've still got the skills I used to have. between or 
the dynamics within our line prides that occurred as the Birmingham boy takeover happened. And we have a question about whether or not after the Birmingham boys killed the Styx females' cubs, whether or not they would ever eat those cubs, or what would occur from there. And I'm going to answer you in one moment. So Century Otter, that was a question from you. The answer is, it very much depends on how the male's feeling at the time. Yeah, they've li they're lying down again. Awesome. Okay, everybody watch your heads. We're going to go slalom race around the silver cluster leaves as we answer. So sometimes male lions do eat the cubs that they've killed, sometimes they don't. With the Birmingham boys, the one actually took one of the cubs and played with it a little bit, cuddled it a little bit, but never, as far as we knew, actually finished it off and ate it. So it does just depend on the lion, but there are lots of, or there are recorded cases of male lions eating the cubs that they have killed. It just depends on, it's, it's more unusual, let's put it this way, it's more unusual for them to have eaten them that it is to not, but the Mapujos were known to do that. The Birmingham boys did eat some of the lioness that they killed. Not completely, but they did have what I could only describe as sort of a, a snack bite. So it does occur. I need to make space for Aubrey as well in here, but let's just have this nice view for now, especially since I can't quite stop the car. Oops. All right. I'm just going to make space for Aubrey, so we've got to go under one more tree. And Taxon, since he also wants to be in the sighting. Let's just go forward a little bit. Hey, everybody, watch your heads again. So for now, we'll stay with the view of the lioness on the right. Let's just see what these two decide to do with the rest of their morning. Now generally, when predators kill other predators, and that can be a predator of the same species, or it can be a predator of different species, in the general pattern is that they are not going to eat them. It's more killing them for are reducing the competition, or in the case of the Birmingham boys, it's killing them in order to... Sorry, hold on one second. I just need to listen to the Game Drive channel. There's a couple of people that want to come and join us. sighting under control. So yes, generally predators don't eat other predators. The Birmingham boys killed the cubs not for food, but in order to bring the sticks or the, to bring the sticks lionesses back into estrus as quickly as possible so that they could mate with them and pass on their own genetics rather than wasting the time raising another set of lion cubs that were not theirs. Now although it's a terribly brutal process from our perspective. From lion's perspective, it makes total sense. A male lion has no idea how long their tenure will last over a couple of prides. It could be six months, it could be three years. Most of the time, however, it only lasts for about a generation's worth of cubs, maybe one, maybe two sets of cubs that they will be able to produce before they have the possibility of a younger and fitter lion coming in and taking over. So rather than spend that whole time, and a female will take 
up to a year and a half, if not longer, before she's ready to mate again if she has young cubs. So rather than wait for all that time and risk losing control of that area, make sense to kill her cubs and bring her back into estrus as fast as possible. Not ideal from a human perspective, but it does make complete sense, and it's one of the ways in which lions have prevented, or lions have evolved to prevent inbreeding, because a male lion is not picky. He will mate with his daughters, and he will mate with his granddaughters, and he will mate with his sister and his mother, if the possibility or the, the opportunity prevent, presents itself. That's why you need that constant flux of males coming in and changing things up so that you don't get the generations of inbred lions. It's something that they control very, very well themselves. It's one of the reasons why Junior left or was sort of pushed out of the Kahuma Pride. He was getting to the stage where he was showing interest in both his mother and his sisters and his aunts. And if there had been no other males around, the Nkuhumas would have mated with him. bird that is currently talking louder than I am this, on this bright morning is a Cape turtle dove and it is a sound that you will hear no matter where you are in the low felt and constantly calling at any time of the year at almost any time of the day you will hear a turtle dove the famous description of that call of course is that he is saying work harder work harder work harder or, depending on the time of day, apparently, drink lager. So it just depends on how you interpret it. Also could be saying its name, Cape Turtle. It's amazing how, as human beings, most of us need to associate words or bits of songs with bird calls in order to learn them. And I promise you, I'm absolutely no exception to that. There's also a Sterling's wren warbler chirping in the background. That very repetitive chippet, 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 chippet. And the black-headed orioles also having a wonderful time. I still am not entirely convinced that these lionesses are done moving for the day. I think they're going to keep going. They don't look fully restful. Head up and ears out. And as I said, not entirely full either. So have we definitely confirmed that these are the Nkuhumas? I mean, I mean they're not the sticks. So the sticks are far more pregnant than these two. Right, Brent has found a leopard on foot. He's not sure how skittish the leopard actually is. So let's go across as he drives in and find out. So it's a big male leopard from the tracks and I followed the drag mark of something he's killed. Now, he ran when he saw me on foot, so we think it's the skittish male. So we're going to come in with me. So we might only get a split-second visual of him. Uh, if not, I think I found where he, he is keeping, where he's got that kill. But I didn't go any closer on foot. I'd rather take you guys in with me on the vehicle. So we're just going to go very slowly, very quietly. Um, till we get in there, and we might get a good visual of him. Now, the other option is, which we'll discuss a little bit, is what we might do is sit very quietly nearby the kill to see if he comes in and gets more relaxed with the vehicle. We won't sit next to the kill. We'll sit probably 50 or 60 meters away, giving him enough space to feel uh, a little bit safe. But this is really exciting. I love seeing new cats. 
So I'm just going to have to concentrate quite hard here. So I did find it when I was walking, and you can see this is quite a thick area, and everything looks quite similar. I'm pretty sure I can get us back to where he was. Now, it looks like quite a big kill, maybe an adult impala, uh, maybe a small kudu or something like that. And I didn't push, as I said, didn't push any closer on foot. You know, he bounded away from me, but it, he didn't sound like he ran too far. So I heard him, doo -doo 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 -doo, but then he stopped, which is a good sign. And leopard will often do that. They'll just run a little bit and then lie down and hide. He was just on the other side of this very thick area here. So I'm just going to sneak forward slightly. And with unrelaxed animals like this, you've got to try to keep your movements down to a minimum. somewhere. I'm just finding find a way to move around. Without making too much noise. Going directly to where the, I think the kill is. I'm taking a slightly wider stance. This way, Dev, so keep a look out over here. jumpy because it looks like a herd of elephants has come through here already as well. So if that kills on the ground, he would have popped it under a thicket very similar to what Tangana did yesterday. Lynn. Lynn says, Brent, you are the leopard whisperer. Well, they had the better of me for a week or two. 
seems like I'm getting some of my mojo back. Probably lying very close to us, just watching us at the moment. So I'm going to go see if I can find the kill. It just gives us a good spot to think about how to reposition or where to wait. So where was I? I was walking just over here, and he ran off somewhere in this vicinity. We're looking under the thickets. Probably gonna have to go for a little walk to find the kill. And once I've found the kill, we can make a plan on how we're gonna go forward with this with this leopard. So while I do that, let's jump back on with Jamie, who's still with those lovely Ingoma ladies. Well, Brent looks for the kill and for the leopard. Our lionesses have been greatly active. I think she twitched an ear once while you were gone. So never fear, you haven't missed anything major. Just a ball of large cat curled up in the grass. And I think probably I said that they weren't finished moving. I'm relatively certain that in fact they are. They're probably going to stay here for the rest of the morning. It's already heated up tremendously from our initial chilly start to the morning. So they're probably going to just wait the day out somewhere and they might move a couple of meters into the block but beyond that i think that they're going to remain absolutely here question of course where it is on everyone's mind is where are the rest of the Nkuhuma lionesses are they on Buyatilla or are they not are they further north towards the manuleti or towards Buffelswick? i don't have an answer to that it's interesting how mysteriously they have moved in the last few days there was a period Last week sometime, where we saw them for the last time, they were looking very, very hungry, very thin. They killed a zebra on Simbabili, were chased off it by the Minjingulans, and after that, I don't think we saw them. From then, I can't think of a sighting where we saw the Nkuhuma lionesses from that point. This is the first time that we have seen them. They've clearly eaten since then. They definitely had a meal. Um, but it hasn't been, for these lionesses at least, it either was a little while ago, or it hasn't, wasn't a particularly large meal because they're not overly full. As to the injury on the one lioness, it could have been either from a hunt or from another lion. Now, I have not much idea as to exactly how old our Kuhuma lionesses are. The one that we were looking at, the one that we had the best view of earlier, it's definitely an older lioness. Her teeth are starting to yellow and to wear down. Her nose is completely black, although that's not 100% reliable at all times. But Curtis was wondering if there are different life expectancies between the males and the females. In lions, in the wild, yes, absolutely. Males have a far shorter life expectancy. Cheers, Tax. Bye, fun. Bye, guys. Lion. Metal. Somebody's up. Somebody's doing something. She's gonna go and cuddle. Oh no, she's going. I thought she was gonna go in for a head rub there. She's just moving down to a different patch of shade. Well, at least they both put themselves in our view now. But yes, the the. Sorry, distraction again. I'm just listening to. Ephraim's update about leopard tracks. I'll find out from him. He's on his way here anyway. It sounds as though he saw leopard tracks around Gallagher shortcut, which could well be Tingana. Of course, we still haven't worked out exactly where Tingana went yesterday. Right, sorry, Curtis. Um, so males have a far shorter life expectancy. It averages around 10, maybe a little bit longer depending on the area. It will differ from 
environment to environment and from ecosystem to ecosystem. But usually it is around 10 years old on average. The female is slightly older, so between 12, 13, even up to 16. I have known lionesses that have lived up to between 14 and 16 years old. It's generally where they reach the end of their lifespan. They don't live as long as leopards do. But it makes sense in most of the mammal species. Oh, having a good sniff of the morning air. In most mammal species, the females have a longer life expectancy than the males. It's the same with human beings on average. Generally, women live longer than men. It's a combination. You can interpret that as you will in wildlife, in African wildlife. A lot of that is due to fighting over mating possibilities as well as a general overall resilience in terms of health from the females. I don't understand that the woman drives the men to the grave. <laughs> VM. VM says it's because women drive men to an early grave. <laughs> I'm not sure about that in lions though. <laughs> Poor lionesses hunt for the males, they feed the males. Not always, though, of course. Bear in mind, I'm just, I'm listing stereotypes here. That they is. They them, they bite them, they take them away. <laughs> he says they get swatted, bitten, and chased away at times. Um, so we could continue the battle of the sexes for long into the morning. <laughs> I'm going to try drag us down that route. <laughs> Although that is highly entertaining. Yes, girl. Yes, girl. I'm on your side. Well, here we go. We're going down a different route. Katrina's saying that personally she thinks that the lionesses are more regal and attractive than the males. Um, I'm not sure. That's a difficult one. A fully grown male lion in the midst of a full roar with a nice clean mane is always a spectacular sighting. But Katrina, I understand where you're coming from. There's certainly, look, okay, we, go, we were running down the, the sort of the road of the stereotype, but there is, the lionesses are a lot more lithe. They're about 100 to 200, 100 kilograms, 200 pounds lighter than the males. And they don't have that bulky mane, which let's face it, looks very pretty, but is a rather stupid thing to have to carry around on your head all day in a place that is 40 degrees in summer. Um, and then of course, it's, it's nice for displaying to the females and it's, it's lovely to protect your neck against the bite of a male lion. But other than that, a completely impractical sort of thing that they have wrapped around their heads, like wearing a head scarf. I think it makes a nice pillow. Summer. Might make a nice pillow though. Very valid argument. Fiam says it might make a nice pillow. In fact, it probably does. And as a result, male lions are more comfortable when they sleep than females. <laughs> that being said, the females can often are seen as the, the hunters of the lion world because they can actually afford to put more energy into hunting. They don't overheat as quickly. They are smaller, lighter, more agile. And as a result, they have become, in inverted commas, the main providers. Ha, the main providers. <laughs> that was unintentional and terribly lame. Um, that being said, the male lions also exert a tremendous amount of energy. They are more than capable of hunting for themselves. And in fact, the Birmingham boys have showed that time and time again, they are very effective buffalo hunters. They are also bigger, stronger, and a pride that has male lions traveling with it will aim for larger prey. The giraffe, the large male buffalo, even Junior, um, at the young age that he was when we sort of last saw him, was participating very actively and playing a crucial ro role in the hunts. That and the fact that the male lions have enormous territories to patrol, and if they don't patrol them, they risk a male lion, another male lion coming in, potentially killing their cubs or killing the females in an unnecessary show of aggression. So they do have a very important job to do. It is just different approaches for the different ways that animals are, ad or are evolved to, or the way in which they're evolved to function. Goodness, that sentence would not really come out of my mouth all that easily. So, 
yes, male lions have a different approach to the way that they work or the way that they do different things. Uh, I'm going to reposition at some point, but Sarah in Ohio has said and confirmed, and Sarah very carefully follows the different lionesses, and in particular the Unkahuma pride. And so I know Sarah did a big project, I think it was last year for school, on the lionesses. So Sarah's confirmed it is the Inkahumas. I thought it was. We just have to, you know what, it's important never to take something for granted. I've been told an individual animal's identity before by another guide and got there and found a completely different animal just because an assumption is made about the area that they're in. So thank you, Sarah. Perfect. Now we know for certain, now we are happy and comfortable with the conclusion that we have drawn. Shall we see if we can't find a nicer spot now that we're the only people here? Good point. Very, very, very good point from Megan. Let's try that again. OK, Wendy. It's all right. I'm sorry about your breaks. Uh, Megan was wondering, I said that lionesses are uh, considerably lighter than the male lions, but I didn't actually explain what they weigh. That's a very valid point from Megan. I think this is probably going to be our best possible... Oh, sorry, forgot I couldn't stop. How's that from your perspective, Ian? That's okay. I think it might be as, as good as we're going to get for now, especially because Ephraim wants to come and join us. So, Megan, valid point. I didn't tell you exactly what the weight was. In, in rough, in kilogram terms, they are about 140-odd kilograms, between 110 and 150. These are lionesses that are on the larger scale in terms of weight. I would put, if I had to guess, at the weight of the largest lioness here, I would say she's about 140 odd kilograms. That equates to close to 300 pounds in weight. So a range between just under 300 pounds to just over 300 pounds. With male lions, a big male lion, about 220 to 240 kilograms. I think the largest ever seen was 250 something in this area i have to try and remember exactly so that equates to 500 odd pounds just under 500 to just over to just over 500 pounds my apologies my pound conversion is not always what it should be but i do sort of roughly times by 2.2 I'm just checking something for you. I want to check what the largest male lion is that's ever been found. Okay, so the largest female was 175 kilograms, but that was not here, that was in Itosha. And that was at the time of this book's publication, which was in 2012. What's that, 175 for the largest female, times by 2.2 is 360 odd, 350 to 360 pounds. The largest male ever recorded was also from Itosha at 260. The heaviest male from Kruger, so I've slightly underestimated the heaviest male from this area, 225. So let's say the Birmingham boys are a bit smaller. Let's say the Matimba males weighed 220 times by 2.2, close to 500 pounds. 470 pounds, give or take a bit. My mental maths, first thing in the morning, times in by 2.2. You'll have to adjust the figures as you see fit, but you get the rough idea. It's a very valid point, Megan, sorry. I gave you the difference between the two, but providing you with an actual sense of scale would have been quite useful as well. So they are big animals. They are very big, incredibly powerful animals. And you only realize how big they are when you see them on foot. <laughs> Christy has called Vim very personable. <laughs> Vim, are you personable? I think you're quite personable. I think you're hilarious. Yeah, I think pretty personable. <laughs> Vim and I will continue our debate about females versus males at some point later after the drive. I think I would also scratch and swat somebody that tried to steal the food that I hunted down. But you never know. <laughs> 
doesn't really work out for them that well. Good morning, Sibu Sisu, the black mama who lives in Hammond's Kraal. It's great to have you with us on the show once again. Sibu Sisu, you missed out on our last serval sighting. It was with Viam, and it was three nights ago, four nights ago, that we had a serval sighting. But Sibu Sisu's question is actually, lions and leopards get habituated to vehicles relatively easily. Why don't servals? Why doesn't something like a serval? When was the last time we saw a serval? Surprisingly, that serval sighting, that serval was actually considerably more relaxed than it would have been during the daytime. If we were to put the same amount of effort that was put into habituating the big cats as was done many, many years ago at the start of the formation of these great game reserves, then we would have serval equally as relaxed. Serval actually habituates people really easily. Whether or not they habituate to vehicles easily, as far as I know, hasn't been something that's been tried all that often. But these lions have been perfectly habituated to vehicles because they have grown up. You can guarantee, no matter how old they are, they will have grown up with vehicles watching them from, the very from their very birth right up until now. And they did go through a stage where they were a bit more skittish than usual, and I think that was just because they'd actually moved into an area where they weren't seeing vehicles all that often before they came back to us. Whether or not that was in the Kruger itself or further north towards Manuleti, we're never quite sure. At the time that these great game reserves were started, habituating the big cats was one of the big projects, and it is absolutely essential to their survival as a species, particularly in a country like South Africa where close to where tourism is one of our biggest revenues because the animals are habituated the tourists come to see them they pay money that therefore goes towards the protection of these animals as a whole so at the time and this would have been anywhere from the 50s to the 70s even into the 80s depending on which part of south africa you are from what the the guys would have been doing they would have been taking a dead impala or a dead springbok depending on where you are in south africa some kind of prey animal putting it in a tree and sitting with the vehicle at 200 meters, then 150 meters, then 100 meters, and then leaving the vehicle with the radio on. And this can take weeks and weeks and months of work to habituate. And you start with a female, because when that female is habituated and she has cubs, then her cubs grow up knowing that vehicles are a good thing. So this, this process didn't happen overnight. We just happen to be reaping the benefits of it now. Could we do the same thing with servals? A bit more difficult because, you know, you can't really, you can't put a bait out for a serval because it'll probably disappear to a leopard or a, to a lion. It's easier to do with apex predators because you don't risk harming them or interfering them in, with them in the same way. Are there other ways that servals could be habituated? Yes. But also bear in mind that servals are a lot fewer in number than something like a leopard or a lion in this area. I'm not, I couldn't give you an exact number. I don't think there's anyone who can give you an exact number in this area without extensive study. But they are less common. And so we see them less frequently. So we have less opportunity to habituate them. I still, I mean, that, that serval that we saw on Zoe's road the other night was relatively relaxed. And it's so nice that we've got to the point that we're privileged enough to be able to sit with the lionesses like this and for them to basically completely ignore our presence. I mean, she's lifted her head now, but she's not looking at us at all. She's lifting her head because she heard something in the bush. And whatever it is, she's... Oh, I was about to say, she's not all that interested. I think she's just going to put her head back down and go to sleep. I mean, we've got a really clear example of how it's not easy to habituate a leopard or a lion overnight. We've seen Gajima. Gajima has been seen for the last six or seven months on odd occasions. 
or at least since I started working here, there were reports of him mating with Karula and Biffle's hook. So this male leopard has been around the area for at least or close to, coming up close to a year. And there's plenty of vehicles that are moving around him. He's probably watched us drive past more times than I can count. But he has not become used to the vehicles overnight, and he's not going to. It will take us considerable time and patience to get him to the point where we will be able to view him. And it might be that whilst we can view Tingana from 50 meters away quite happily, and he will ignore us, and that he'll walk right past the car, it might be that with that particular leopard, he continues to need a bit more personal space or has a larger comfort zone with a vehicle. It remains to be seen exactly. Tingana apparently was relatively skittish when he first arrived. He was an Ottawa leopard, if I'm not mistaken. So from the far, far west of here, not used to vehicles at all. And it did take him a considerable period of time to become relaxed or as relaxed as he has reached at this point, that he will walk past and sort of almost brush the car with his tail, which is something that we're exceptionally privileged and perhaps sometimes we take for granted while we're out here. We don't realize just how lucky we are. The Inkahumas, interestingly enough, just talking about the ways that animals have been habituated, not habituated, habituated is perhaps in this respect the wrong word, but have got used to being tracked. When I first started work, working here, if you were tracking the Inkahumas, Nine times out of ten, you would see their bottoms disappearing into the bushes, never to see them again. When you went back to get the vehicle, they were gone. Now, at 100 meters, at 50 meters, you can actually watch them. They will stand and watch you. They don't get scared. They don't run away. They just keep an eye on you. And you move, and then immediately you can move backwards out of their space and go and fetch the vehicle and enjoy a sighting like this. It's nice to see that they've relaxed far more to people on foot. Maybe because Junior's gone. That's one of the theories that's been put forward. Uh, Kathy in Washington, while we watch our... Let me just let Franklin finish its sentence. We finished there. Kathy, sorry, you were wondering if, while we watch the sleeping lioness, if lionesses prefer a more closed environment to male lions, if male lions will prefer to sleep out in the open. You might find that, Kathy, there's a slight skew in favor of females favoring slightly more closed habitats. That being said, I've seen the Inkahumas sleeping right out in the open before with no problems at all. It's far more a shade and temperature driven choice that they make. It's when females have cubs or are coming close to having cubs that perhaps you'll see them moving more and more into thick vegetation where they can hide their cubs. The Nkumas have spent a lot of time in the drainage line system around Galago Pan. I don't think that's because they are females. I think that is just because they enjoy it there. But that will also, Kathy, the other th thing that will factor in rather than necessarily just gender is the number of lions that you have. So the more lions they, that are within the pride, the more comfortable they will feel. So the Nkumas, when they do lie out in the open, it's usually with all five of them. No, it just depends on the number. But yes, there might be a slight skew in favor of the females being in closed habitats. They are slightly more under threat, but for the most part, there's not much that's going to come in trouble a couple of lionesses sleeping out in the open. Now, speaking of different predators, let's find out how Brent's search has been going. So, we did find that leopard again on foot. He actually came charging past Dave when he spotted me walking. We haven't been able to find the carcass just yet. So, what we're going to do is, I'm going to leave that area. He's very, very not relaxed. And uh, there's a lot of these guys around. And I'm probably going to come back with Jamie after game drive. And we'll go for a, another walk in that area and follow those drag marks all the way. But unfortunately, too many Ellie's around. So what I think has happened is that he was dragging that I presume an impala or small kudu just from the size of the drag mark. 
and I think the elephant's chased him. So he's, he's dropped that carcass somewhere, and we're not exactly 100% sure where yet, and I think it's going to take a, a quite a lot of walking very carefully uh, to find where it is, because the LE tracks have also obliterated quite a bit of the drag mark. And uh, also, he's had two scares this morning. He's seen me twice, so give him some yes, time yes. to relax and hopefully we'll be able to find him for the sunset safari. So I'm pr very confident he's got food there. So after the first time, um, he spotted me and ran off and we went back to fetch the vehicle. Um, I went and got out of the vehicle for the second time and while I was walking a little bit to the north of the car, he ran probably seven or eight meters past the car next to Dave. Right next to, right next to Dave. And I, you can actually hear him when the leopard runs fast. And all of a sudden, I just heard Dave's whistle. And uh, I assumed that the leopard had passed quite close to him when I heard him start whistling. That nice big elephant cow and a really lovely comment from Brian. Brian says he doesn't interact frequently but been watching Safari Live for the last six months with his kids and he just wanted to say really enjoying it and thanks a lot guys. Good job. Well thank you Brian and hopefully you keep watching and wonderful that you're sharing it with your children. Uh, they are the future, the next generation of conservationists in the making. There we go. There's a young one. I'm just going to move forward. I think she might pop out onto the road next to us. 